When's Helen due back, do you say? Tell them why. I know how jolly lost I feel without Rachel. Come on, man, come on, flush him out. <laughs> concentrate, lad, concentrate. I'm not going to kill filing a nail. You tell Mary that. Come on. I say, oh, Jerry's getting impatient. Mm. What do you say if I shoot him? Make an even 50 brace. <laughs> I'm absolutely panting for a cup of tea. Oh, dear. What intensity following their face. Oh, well, in Neil's case, it's more likely to be crap. <laughs> <laughs> and with Freddie, just plain boredom. <laughs> what about Dennis? Dennis? Who knows what goes on in Dennis's mind? I must say, Jerry, I'd hate to be facing you in a duel. In more dithering like that, old man, we won't be waiting for no duel. Hey. Well, come on, let's call it a day. Cathcart! Come on, home! Weather's breaking up. Not at all. <laughs> What's the time, Mary dear? It's quarter to ten. Oh. Well, I shall go to bed. It's this Yorkshire air, it's so elevated. It certainly seems to have a stupefying effect on the men. What's that, dear? Good <laughs> morning. Right, I think I'll come up too. Night, night, Rachel. Night, Freddy. Night, old thing. Good night, Mrs. Marchbury. Good night. You're not to be long, Neil. Oh, all right, Molly. Just wiping the floor with the uncap cart. Good night, Dennis. Ma mignonne. Je te donne la bonne nuit. Sleep well, darling. Look, Jenny. You got anything there for me? No, milady. A little bit of a card for you, Mr. Oppermann. Oh, thank you, Fleming. Corsica. Who's it from? <laughs> Whimsy by name and whimsy by nature, huh? Peter! <laughs> he daring to send through His Majesty's post. When's he coming back? Doesn't say. Just next stop, Paris. Trust old Peter. <laughs> Damn! I left for you, Captain Captain. Good news. Come on, Colonel. Put me out of my misery. I... Come in. The evening post, Your Grace. Thank you, Fleming. Put them down. Not bad. Fifty-one brace with four guns. Excellent, Your Grace. Is there anything Your Grace requires? No. Down boozing till all hours. Darling girl, you know perfectly yes, well. Yes, perfectly well. Dennis, you're to make him come up. Of course, Rachel. At gunpoint, if necessary. <laughs> you are good at that. You're too beautiful to need my compliments. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night, darling. I'll be up later. <clears throat> if you gentlemen require anything further. Oh, thank you, Fleming. I think we can fend for ourselves. Night, Cup Girl. Uh, 
No, better not. I've already been summoned to the nuptial couch. <laughs> Thanks for the game, sir. Enjoyed it. Good night, you two. Night. Night. Well, you look a bit down in the mouth. Oh, not really. It's just one of those days. I got a lot of shares on the market and I've managed to hit a blasted bird all day. <laughs> it's a damn fool world at times. And a great one at others. Mm. I reached a momentous decision today. Oh? I'm going to marry Mary. She'll be delighted. You've been engaged for eight months. No, no, no. What I mean is, I'm going to ask her to name the day. Oh, I see. Yes, that's a bit more like it. I never could see much point in those long, drawn-out engagements. My feelings precisely. Mary and I have, so to speak, saluted the conventions. Why hang about any longer? Spoken like a true romantic. Well, you live. Ah, oh, there's only one place for me. Paris. They understand La Belle Vie over there. God. Yes. A word with you? Won't keep, I'm afraid. We'll cut it short, that's all. I'll try to. Uh, does the name Tom Freeborn mean anything to you? It rings some sort of bell. Why? Well, Tom's an old friend. We were up at the house together. I'm sorry, Ben, but that's He's a civil cons- engineer. He's got some sort of job out in Egypt. Uh, where he's working, he doesn't get the newspapers regularly. So it was only two or three weeks ago he saw the announcement of your engagement to my sister in the Times. He recognised your name and your photograph. So? I had this from him tonight. He says... He says he knew you in Paris two years ago and that you made money cheating at cards. Cheating at cards. What does that matter? Well, what does that matter? Well, Tom Freeborn's a salt of the earth. Then you'll have to believe what he says, won't you? You mean you don't deny it? It wouldn't be any good, my denying it. You'll have to make up your own mind. Yes, Scott, I would have thought that under the circumstances... I don't care what you think or what you do. For God's sake, leave me alone. My dear fellow, I'm not much of a hand at this sort of situation. But, well, you being engaged to Mary, I... Oh, if that's what's worrying you, it's... It's off. Off? What's off? Our engagement. What the... Do- I was going to talk to Mary about it this afternoon. Mm. I haven't told her yet. You've broken off the engagement and you haven't told her mm. yet? Well, that's pretty cool, Cathcart, I must say. <laughs> that's pretty damn cool. You utter swine. Who the hell do you think you are coming here and jilting my sister? They're not a swine, of course. I forbid you to see her again. Do you hear me, sir? If you try, I'll break every bone in your body. Oh, poor Denver. All that blue blood. You haven't the faintest idea what life's about. Understand me, sir. You leave this house first thing in the morning. Sorry, Denver. I leave here when I choose. And that happens to be now. Cathcart, come back. Cathcart! Come back, you bloody fool! Neil! Neil! Cat What's happening? Oh. Fleming? Oh. Your Grace? Have you seen Captain Cathcart? Yes, he left by the front door. Oh, damn. Your Grace? Oh, what's it matter? Let him drown. Are you locked up yet? Uh, not yet, Your Grace. Well, when you do, leave the conservatory door on the latch. Yes, Your Grace. That's not a swine, Sam. Poor little Mary. Damn hard lines. It's a good thing we found out before it was too late.
God. Oh, Jerry, you killed him. Diversité, c'est ma devise. La Fontaine was right, eh, Bunter? Bunter? What was that, my lord? La Fontaine, I said he was right. Variety, he said, is the spice of life. Yes, indeed, my lord. Three months in the wilds of Corsica have blunted your ear, my old assistant sleuth. <laughs> ah, coffee and croissant. Nothing like it. Nothing like it in the world. It... I say, what's going on, Bunter? Well, losing your grip, old lad. We're staying here a fortnight, you know. A deviled kidneys, my lord? Did I or did I not make it perfectly clear that we were staying in Paris for at least two blissful weeks? You made it perfectly clear, my lord. Then why are all my bags, not to mention your photographic paraphernalia, repacked, relabeled, and standing out there as they're ready for the off? Excuse me, my lord, but having seen this morning's copy of the Times, I had no doubt your lordship would wish to return to Riddlesdale at once. Riddlesdale? Captain Cathcart has been found shot dead. Good God. The police suspect a foul play. Poor devil. Oh, poor little Mary, too. I say, this looks a messy business, Bunter. Poor old Jerry, he's going to hate this. When's the next train? I assumed your lordship would wish to take the quickest route, so I took it upon myself to book two seats on the aeroplane Victoria. You did quite right, Bunter. You're far from losing your grip. Poor old Jerry. Uncommonly worrying for him, what? Ironic, too. Always hated me getting mixed up with the police. Now he seems to have landed in the thick of them himself. When's the Victoria leave? 11.30. Ah, I suppose one must have breakfast. Yeah. Bit heavy for flying on, perhaps. Sorry, Bunter. Who's on the case, by the way, does it say? Inspector Parker. Oh, I say, splendid. That is excellent. Good old Charles. 11 when, did you say? 30, my lord. And we reach Riddlesdale. Too late, I fear, to be in time for the inquest. So, you did nothing further in the matter? Well, what do you expect? I should go running after him? Besides, it was a brute of a night. I thought he'd change his mind and come back before long. That's why I told Fleming not to lock the conservatory door. I see. And, um, having given that instruction, you went quietly to bed and never saw the deceased again? Not until I fell over him outside the conservatory door at three in the morning. Ah, yes. Now, can you tell us how you came to be out of doors at that time? I wasn't sleeping well. I decided to go for a walk. At three in the morning? Why not? Even though it was such a brute of a night? Well, I told you I was restless. Besides, my wife was away. <laughs> Silence, please. Very well, you went for a walk. Uh, what time did you leave your bedroom? Oh, I don't know. 2.30, I imagine. And uh, which way did you go out? Through the conservatory door. And the body was not there when you went out? Well, if it had been, I'd have had to walk over it, wouldn't I? Uh, where did you walk to? Down the garden, out onto the moors. You actually left the ground? Naturally. And how far did this walk take you? I don't know. Hard to tell. A quarter of a mile? Possibly. Half a mile? Possibly. And during that time, or any other time, you heard no shot? None. Yes. Now, can you show us the letter you had from this, uh, Mr. Freebone? Well, uh, as a matter of fact, I, I, I thought I had it in my pocket, but I couldn't find it for the inspector here from Scotland Yard. I'm afraid I must have destroyed it. That's rather unfortunate. It is, rather. You can show the jury no proof that you ever received it. Not unless Fleming remembers it. Ah, yes. No doubt we can check it in that way. Thank you, Your Grace. Call Dr. Thorpe. What the devil's he up to? Mm -hmm. The Duke, what's the matter with him? You'll be well asked, Inspector. Look, if he's got something to say, you better tell him to say it. I'm only Otherwise... his solicitor. He won't listen to me. I examined the deceased at about 4.30 a.m. I judged him to have been dead between three and four hours. And then I can take you that he was shot somewhere between uh, 12.30 and 1 a.m. So that death would have occurred... Not necessarily, no. Death, you see, would not be instantaneous. Oh? No, the deceased might conceivably have lost consciousness, but in all probability, he would have lingered for some considerable time. I see. Did you subsequently conduct a post-mortem examination? Yes, I found that the lungs had been pierced by a bullet which had been deflected from a rib. Death resulted eventually from loss of blood and suffocation. There was nothing to show that the uh, wound had been self-inflicted? It could well have been. 
But the bullet could equally well have been fired by somebody else at close range. It could. Thank you, Doctor. Call Lady Mary Whimsy. Thank you. I mean to say she'd been engaged to the fella for eight months. What the Jews kept him back in the paddock, you imagine? He used to live in Paris, I believe. They planned setting up house there after their marriage, according to my mother. Look, maybe that was it. Temptations, fear of what? Huh? Perhaps, my lord, or perhaps Lady Mary simply changed her mind. So the last time you were in Paris, Lady Mary, was uh, nine months ago? Last February. Uh, just, just after we got engaged. With regard to your marriage, had any money settlement been going into? Uh, no, I don't think so. We hadn't fixed a date for the marriage. You always seem to have plenty of money. Yes, I think so. I, I didn't think about it. You never heard him complain about being hard up? Oh, my goodness, everybody complains about that, don't they? <laughs> you heard what your brother has said about deceased wishing to break off the engagement. Had you any idea of this? No, no, that's not the slightest. Can you think of any explanation now? Absolutely none. There'd been no quarrel? No. So as far as you knew on the Wednesday night, you were still engaged to deceased with every prospect of marrying oh, him yes. shortly? Yes, uh, certainly I was. When you say good night to Captain Cathcart, what sort of a mood was he in? Uh, well, he was playing billiards with Colonel Marchbanks. I, I think he was in a very cheerful mood. He seemed to me to be in a very cheerful frame of mind. Cheerful, Lady Mary? Uh, well, you know, good humoured. Now, this is important. Because your brother has told us that when, when, when he went to see deceased in his room, before he even broached the subject of uh, Mr. Freeborn's letter, he appeared to be thoroughly out of humour. Yes, sir. Well, I know. I, I just can't explain it. Your brother has described exactly what occurred between himself and Captain Cathcart. Now, did you hear them quarrelling? Well, I... No, no, I heard raised voices and footsteps and a door banging. But, you know, my room is at the back of the house. The whole thing is very indistinct. Besides, I was very tired. I did, really didn't even think about it very much. I went to sleep almost straight away. What happened then? Um... Well, something woke me. I... I actually, I heard a shot. It was very distinct. I was quite sure that it was a shot. That's what made me go downstairs. You went I downstairs by yourself. That was very plucky of you, Lady Mary. Did you go immediately? No. I put on some brogues and a coat over my nightdress. And it probably took me a couple of minutes before I got down. To the conservatory. Now, why'd you go to the conservatory? The front door is much nearer. Well, it's a lot quicker than trying to unbolt the front door. And when you entered the conservatory? I... I could see that the outer door was open. And outside, I could see a man kneeling on the ground over something. And when he looked up, I could see that it was my brother. Uh, your brother has described that when you entered the conservatory, you cried out, Oh, God, Jerry, you've yes, killed him. I, now, can you uh, tell us why uh, you yes, did that? Yes, I know. Well, I dare say that I, uh, what I thought was that my brother had probably come across a, across a burglar, perhaps, and, and, and fired in self-defense. You were aware that your brother possessed a revolver? Oh, yes, I think... Yes, I, I think so. But what happened next? I, I, um, my brother asked me to go upstairs to wake people and get help, so I woke the Marchbanks and the Arbuthnots. By that time, I was feeling terribly faint, so I went back to my room and took some salve What me. time was all this? I think, I what, know, what time, time did you hear the shot? I... Uh, well, three o'clock. Three o'clock? I... Well, I mean, approximately. I can't be absolutely Yeah, but it sure. seems that we've already established that the fatal shot was fired not later than 1.30. Well, I... Yes, well, in that case, perhaps I'm slightly mistaken. Mistaken, Lady I... Mary. 1.30 to 3 a.m., I mean, that is... Or are you saying there were two shots? No, I'm not. I'm just... So what are you saying? I'm just... What I'm trying to say... What I'm trying to say is... That there are a whole lot of people oh, come running come about... Please, so please, I, 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 I... Call John Ardra. The man has gone too far. Marvels, is there still no news of Lord Peter? He left Corsica for Paris, that's all we know. I swear by almighty God that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Now then, you are John Ardraw, head gamekeeper on the Riddlesdale estate. Yes, sir. Now, you live with your wife in the little cottage just inside the main entrance to Riddlesdale Lodge. That's all, sir. Now, did anything disturb you on Wednesday night or the early hours of Thursday morning? Well, I heard a shot fired. It sounded pretty close. Uh, there's several acres of preserved plantation behind the cottage, and I thought a poacher might have got in. What did you do? Well, uh, I got my gun, and I, I went for a walk around, but I didn't see a living soul. 
Did you fire your gun at any time? No, sir. And what time did you hear this shot? Uh, ten minutes to twelve. You sure of that? Aye, sir, quite sure. You didn't hear any other shots? None. None? Well, none save the first. But that shot, you say, did not wake you? No, 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 it was the Duke shouting after Captain Cathcart from his bedroom window. Well, I mean, I assume it was from his bedroom. How else could I hear it so clearly? You heard what was said? Oh, yes. Come back, Cathcart. That's what he said. Come back, you be fool. And afterwards? Well, as I say, I wasn't sleeping very well, so I got up to write some letters at the desk. About um, oh, an hour later, my husband woke up and told me to come to bed. He said, you're the only sinner burning the midnight oil. Everybody else is turned in. Well, I said, I don't think so. I think the Duke is still up. Well, you see, our bedroom is over his study, and I could hear somebody moving about below. Mm. You went back to bed? Oh, yes, but I didn't sleep very well, and I was lying awake when Lady Merwin knocked at our door. Now, this shot she mentioned, you say you did not hear it. No, I've just said. I heard no shot at that time. Did you hear a shot at any time during the night? Yes, just after my husband had called me back to bed. I heard a shot quite distinctly. What time was that? About midnight. Midnight? You're sure of that? My dear man, quite, quite sure. Certainly wasted no time in getting on with the inquest. It does seem to be rather a precipitate muddle. Now spell that, Bunter. Well, uh, P, R, E, C. I uh, just hope the coroner and this local ad crates give old Jerry a fair deal, that's all. When you arrived at... Uh... Riddlesdale, Inspector Craigs. The body, you say, was... Lying on path, sir, outside conservatory door. Ah. Deceased, we dressed in dinner jacket and pumps. We are at the court. We were wet through. And besides being much bloodstained, the clothes were very muddy and greatly disarranged. The pockets contained a cigarette case and a small, flat pocket knife. Now tells? Now tells. I take it you uh, examined the ground surrounding the body? As soon as it will, out, sir. There were blood marks all along the path leading to conservatory and signs consistent with the dragging of a body to the point where it was found. And upon further investigation, you... I found in a small clearing here a great pool of blood, handkerchief soaked in blood, and a revolver. Revolver. Thank it's you. It's of American pattern without any distinguishing mark. 38 Smith and Wesson. One bullet had been discharged. I would like to recall the Duke of Denver. It was disgraceful, Duchess, disgraceful. The coroner behaved most improperly. He'd no business to give such a summing up. Yes, he was a bit sick, I must say. He didn't leave those poor blighters much choice, did he? Don't be absurd, Freddie. They had every choice. They returned a verdict of murder against Gerald for one reason and one reason only. They're socialists, every one of them. Little Englanders. Oh, I wouldn't go so far as that, dear lady. And I would, Mr. Murbles. Show a title to their kind these days. It's like a red rag to a bull. And with respect, Your Grace, political malice wasn't the only reason for the verdict. There was the question of the revolver. That was Gerald's revolver. He admitted that. Yes, he kept it in a drawer in his study, he said. With the key kept permanently in the lock. Well, I mean to say... It was a bit light-hearted. I mean to say, just because it was his, doesn't necessarily prove it was he who used it. Well... I mean, anyone could... Still, Mr. Parker, I expect you'll have the whole thing cleared up in no time. Perhaps you've got the real culprit up your sleeve already. Not quite, but I'll do my best to get him. With, no doubt, a little help from... My your... brother-in-law, oh, Mr. Parker. No doubt you are very amused at the antics of the family amateur. Far from it, Your Grace. Peter, we're expecting Peter. One doesn't expect Peter, Freddy. Either he's all over you when least wanted, or nowhere to be found when he is. But we don't even know his address in Paris. Well, I've been under the embassy. They've promised to get in touch with him as soon as they can. If he's there, that is. Well, he jolly well ought to be here. I mean, there's poor old Jerry languishing in quad. If anything <laughs> does happen to him... Well, I mean, old Peter's head of the family till young pickled gherkins comes of age. Hello, dear old things. Speak of the devil. Ah, oh, Fleming. Give Bunter a hand with the bags, will you? There's a good fellow. At once, my lord. Hello, Freddy. Keep them amused. Hello, Peter, old lad. <laughs> Helen, you look stunning in adversity. 
She nailed her colours to the mast, a Roman matron to the last. Is that in the uh, Oxford Dictionary of Quotations? Not yet, but it will be. Give it another ten years. Nice to see you, Charles. <laughs> Hello, Peter. And you, Mr. Marvel. Good to see you, Lord Peter. We were just agreeing you were sadly missed. Yeah, well, you two do rather seem to have mucked things up between you. I heard all about Jerry from the taxi fellow. York Prison. Mm. How's Mary, Helen? Very upset, I think. Rachel's with her. Oh, well, never mind. She'll keep. I... Tonight, Parker and I hold high rebel. Tonight he shows me all the bloody footprints. It's all right, Helen, that's not swearing. That's an adjective of quality. Incidentally, I'm afraid you're going to be pretty upset when you've digested the evening headlines. Headlines? Dowager Duchess strikes again. Oh, my God. What's she done now? Well, not actually struck, but heading north, I understand. Probably intending to set up some sort of HQ right opposite the prison gates. Well, you can't be serious. I say, do you suppose she plans to bake a cake for Jerry with a hacksaw blade inside it? No, not quite her style. But if I were the governor, I think I'd box a bit clever for the next few days. Mother can be pretty formidable when the spirit moves her. Impossible, I should say. Oh, I wouldn't say that, Helen. At a time like this, acting as though she were the mother of some Croydon bank clerk caught dipping into the petty cash. Yeah, I told you you were going to be upset, old girl. I am. Deeply upset. She is too, my dear. Emotional outbursts from the ice queen herself. Never thought I'd live to see the day. It's been a very disturbing experience for all of us. Well, old Parker Bird, let's hear the worst. Now, what miracle are you here, anyway? Well, largely luck, actually. The uh, chief constable of Stapley sent for us over Craig's head. <laughs> I bet Craig's loved that. <laughs> anyway, as soon as the message came through, I nipped into the chief and asked for the job. The trouble was, I was tying up a few details on a forgery case, so I was a bit of a late starter, I'm afraid. By the time I got here, Craig's and the coroner were as thick as thieves. They'd arranged the inquest for, the, for this morning, which was absurd. And you, Mr. Murbles. What are you unhappy about in particular? Primarily that I couldn't contact Sir Impey Biggs in time. Oh, old Impey defending. Oh, I say that's splendid. I don't suppose yeah. we should see him now before Monday. And then. But I must say it, Wimsy. Your brother has gone out of the way to make difficulties. Not only for himself, but for all of us who are trying to help him. What sort of difficulties? Why was he in the garden at three o'clock in the morning? He will not give us a frank explanation. You mean old Jerry's fibbing? Well, shall we say? His behaviour this morning left much to be desired. And then there's the whole business of the shooting. Now, I know old Dr Thorpe won't permit himself, but it certainly wasn't suicide. How do you know? Well, I didn't want to upset Jerry's story, so I played my own bit down like Billy O. But all that stuff about him finding Cathcart so upset and so go to blazes in his manner, well, that was just my whiskers. No, no, Mr. About that. That part of the Duke's testimony, I believe, absolutely. Well, I was the last one with Cathcart before Jerry saw him. We had a nightcap, and he was on top of the world. Any particular reason? Because he'd made up his mind. In the morning, he was going to ask Mary to agree to a date for their wedding. And then he said, we shall go and live in Paris, where they understand La Belle Vie. I tell you, he went upstairs to bed whistling. Thank you, Freddy. Invaluable man. Charles, I feel the grass growing under our feet. Come on. Bumpy across the channel, Charles, but a glass of bubbly soon soothes the tongue. You know, it's rather a good idea to keep one's crimes in the family. One has so many more facilities. La rotisserie de la reine pedac. I say. South wind. Manon Lesco. Well, it looks as though he works out rather true to type. True to what type? <laughs> you may well ask, Charles. Baisser du soir. I only saw him once. Oh, a vain young dog, you know, by the look of all this. I must say I was rather surprised at Mary taking to him. Then I really know awfully little about Mary. Any joy with you? I thought there might have been some signs of his having written or started to write a letter. In answer to the one he received? Yes, now what about that? Well, we know he received it, but we can't find a trace of it. Now, there's nothing in the ashes in the grate because there's a roaring fire in these bedrooms every night, but, well, I'm almost certain he burnt it. Bad news. Bad enough to transform a gay young lover contemplating urn per amour in Paris into a snarling curmudgeon when my brother busts in. Peter, let's assume. What would do that, blackmail? Well, I think it's the most likely. Yeah, all right, all right, all right. Now, let us just assume that our blackmailers are summoning him to a rendezvous. Jerry delays him with more ugly news, by which time Cathcart don't give a damn anyway. 
So pausing only long enough to spit in my bewildered brother's eye, he hurtles downstairs, snatches the revolver, and rushes forth to do or... Ah. Don't really work, do it? No. There's the time lapse, you see. And anyway, he didn't leave with the revolver. Fleming would have seen him take it. So he would, old Killjoy. Hmm. Let's have a look outside. There's confounded letters. What? Well, there's the other ones. Well, it's uh, you know, Tom Freeborn. Now, where the dickens could Gerald have put that? Well, the Duke says he destroyed it. But as Mervyn's insists, that's absurd, and I agree with him. I mean, if he was going to throw that sort of charge up in Cathcart's face, he'd hardly dispose of the evidence which supported it, would he? Well, Sherry, Peter. Not at the moment, thanks. And I wouldn't advise you to, either, not if it's Jerry's. Look, get Fleming to rustle up a bottle of Crew 21. On the other hand, you know, if he has that letter, or knows what it is, why not produce it? Why, indeed. I mean to say, a lark's a lark, but when it comes to the gallows... Do you suppose your brother really contemplates the gallows? Well, I assume Merville put it to him pretty straight. Yes, I'm sure he did, but do you think the Duke realises, I mean, imaginatively, that it is possible to hang an English peer on circumstantial evidence? Uh, uh, imagination ain't Gerald's strong point. <laughs> I suppose they do hang peers. I mean, they can't behead them on Tower Hill or anything. Well, they certainly hanged Earl Ferrers in uh, 1760. Did they, though? As well as the old pagan said of the Gospels, after all, it was a long time ago. Let's hope it wasn't true. It was true, all right. And what's more, they dissected and anatomized him afterwards. At least that part of the treatment's obsolete. Oh, it's a pity. Sort of detail that might have appealed to Jerry and make him start taking matters seriously. Yeah, we've got to do something, old lash. Can't have him cooped up like this. Awfully unpleasant for him. Particularly with the birds being so good this year. That's where they found the body. And these marks? Well, he'd either been dragged or somehow managed to crawl from the spot where he'd actually been shot. Which was? Over there. Footprints? Yes, mainly crates in his local elephants. I've eliminated them. Also, Mr. Arbuthnot's bedroom slippers. Uh, Lady Mary's brogues. Your brother's shooting boots. Mrs. Marchbank's galoshes, you name them, I've got them all tabbed. All except one. This, my dear Whimsy, belongs to no one I've ever seen or heard of. Hooray! And what's more, there are some better prints over here. Then downward from the steep hill's edge, they track the footsteps small. Only they're largish. Man's number ten with a worn down heel and a patch on the left inner side. Now, let's see. They advanced from, yes, from the shrubbery to here. Well, they seem to hang around for a while. Of course! They then move across the gravel, which shows no footmarks, until they arrive at this point where the body was found. So, our unknown gets this far. What was he going to do then, do you think? Let's see where he was shot. Um, sit here. One, two, three, four. Fifteen. Fourteen. Fifteen. 16, we found the handkerchief and the revolver by this tree. Nineteen. Twenty. And Cathcart was shot? Here. Twenty-one. Apart from the blood patches, not very revealing, I'm afraid. The rain and the mud had messed everything up by the time I'd arrived. We'll come back to this later. What I'd like to do first is to trace where number 10 came from. Well, as I was saying, what with the rain and the mud, I followed his footprints to uh, that mark there. And that's where they end. Not that won't do at all. Hello, this may be our friend. In fact, I think it is. Well, if it was, we've lost him now. Must have been in quite a hurry. I've found him! Good! The human frame ain't made for this scoop arm business. He tripped over this route. Serve him glad. And so, he goes on until the boundary wall. And the exact point where he got in. Oh, well done, Charles. A recent demolition, wouldn't you say? Could have just lodged him when he scrambled over. Now, oh, hang on. Yes, there's the dent where he dropped down on his heels. Give us a back, old thing, right? Okay. Right. 
I say, you, uh, you won't dislodge any of those big stones, will you? <sighs> Not too secure. Oh, how very obliging of him. Confessed, has he? Fragment of Burberry, no less. And blood. I must have caught his hand. Or... What's on the other side? A rough track, as far as I can see. I'm going over. You all right? Muddy, but unbowed. Well, hang on, I'm coming over. Oh! How very athletic of you, Charles. You know, our number ten must be a man of above average height. And exceptional agility. Quite. See, what a very communicative verge this is. What? Motorcycle tracks. Oh, yes, parked here. More tracks. Two motorcycles. Two motorcycles? But only one number ten. Either that or one motorcycle. And sidecar. Right. Front wheel, back wheel, sidecar, of course. He parks his bus out of sight so as not to invite attention while he's reconnoitering. He climbs the wall, dislodging the stones as he does so, and proceeds to the conservatory. And some time later on... Something disturbs him? Now, wait a minute, wait a moment. Broken branch, broken root, torn Burberry. Some time later on, something scares him out of his wits, and all he can think about is the shortest cut back to his machine regardless. Splendid. I am greatly cheered, old Parker Bird. My turn, I think. Did you ever read the lay of the last minstrel, Charles? Well, that did a fair amount of it at school. Why? Well, there was a goblin page boy in it. He was always yelling, found, 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 at the most unnecessary moments. I always thought he was a terrible nuisance, but now I know exactly how he felt. What's the matter? By Joe. 